Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today we are going to be taking a look, a tabletop overview and comparison of the Colt SP-1 and the Beretta AR-70. We will start off with a little bit of historical context and then move through a point-by-point -point comparison of the two. So if you're interested in sort of the development and where these two platforms sort of met in history, it's an interesting story. You'll have a better idea of that. Anyway, if that all sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up now. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the historical overview. It's kind of an interesting, paints an interesting picture in the history of arms development around the time of the Cold War between the 60s and the 70s. Now, this is a Colt SP-1. This is manufactured by Colt between the late 60s and early 80s as a civilian uh, legal option for the M16 that they're putting out in M16A1. Now, this is an AR-70, of course, the classification of the same rifle, the AR-70, used by the military in Italy. Uh, this is, of course, an import model, which was semi-automatic only. The AR-70 in, in Italian forces was very quickly adopted and into an upgraded variant, the AR-7090, which we did not have any versions of on the civilian market. This is a pre-banned firearm. By the time the ban was imposed, the importation ban, these could no longer come in. These are very uncommon in the United States, and of course there are no uh, at least commercially produced semi-automatic versions of the AR-7090. There may be some floating around that people have built from parts kits and, and stuff like that, but none that were actually manufactured as a completed rifle and then imported into the United States. So to make a very long and complicated story a little bit more, uh, a little bit shorter, again, I have an entire video on the development of the M16. It's about an hour long. You can go check that out. I will leave a link in the description. Eugene Stoner, of course, throughout the early 60s, develops the M16. He sells the rights of the M16 to Colt. Colt then gets a contract with the government to sell the firearm, which of course we all know, and then that a whole process was taking place during the early to mid stages of the Vietnam War. Now, Eugene Stoner was, of course, because he could not create an exact copy or closely related pattern of the M16, he, de he decided to ve develop what ended up being the AR-18 and then the civilian version, the AR-180, which of course the military was not interested in. Now, the interesting thing about the development and sort of where this starts of the M16 is the development and use of an intermediate cartridge. And over in the communist bloc, of course, they were doing the same thing with the AK-47 and AKM patterns. Of course, the, the, the road to that was paved with the Sturmgewehr by the Germans uh, during, the World War, during World War II where the use of an intermediate cartridge was going to start taking over use in militaries around the world. Italy is sitting over there and they are noticing the development of the M16 and they are seeing definitely the practical uh, applications of it. It's a very viable cartridge in the 223 or the 556. Um, very inexpensive to manufacture, very easy to, uh, to use and to handle and to maintain, uh, and it growing more popular with people who are issued them. Italy decides that they would like to get a contract with Colt to manufacture uh, an M16 variant uh, basically and, and pay royalties on their, or, or not really royalties, but buy rights to manufacture the pattern. Colt declines because at this time, their, you know, sort of their golden egg, the M16, is taking on worldwide. And there's a lot of opportunity to make a ton of money with this, so they're, they're not interested in licensing it out to other manufacturers. Beretta starts, and or Beretta uh, co-ops with SIG, and they develop what would sort of end up being the model AR-70, SIG would go their own way and you know get into the 550 series of rifles and then Beretta would continue with the 7090. Now although there are some similarities between the M16 pattern and the AR-70, there are a lot of differences. You definitely will see influences from other platforms. You can definitely see influences from SIG in here. Um, but you'll see some sort of similarities between the AK pattern, of course the AR pattern. Uh, so a really, really unique and interesting firearm and I think would be a lot more popular today if more of them had been brought into the country. But anyway, with all that sort of context out of the way, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at a comparison between the two. So getting started, the SP-1 is a total length of 39 inches with a height from the bottom of the pistol grip to the top of the rear sight, 
tower, or I guess the carry handle, of nine inches. The Beretta AR70 is a total length of 37 and a half inches, so about an inch and a half shorter, with a total height from the top of the sight to the bottom of the pistol grip of eight inches. Now, you will notice that the AR70 does come standard with a 30 round magazine. The original M16s, as we all know, were issued with a 20 round magazine, although, of course, you can get 30, and, you know, of course, sky's a limit on different products that are manufactured, drum mags and the 75 round coffin mags. I think that that's what they hold. Okay, taking a look at the barrel, the early M16s, as we all know, had the iconic three prong flash hider. Now, the early Colt SP1s would have also had this flash hider. The later ones would have moved to the birdcage, just like they did on the later adoptions of the XM6. Well, actually, the XM16E1 had a three prong too, but when they moved to the M16A1, and the late 604 for the Air Force, it had moved to a birdcage. You typically see birdcage flash hiders on SP1s. This one has a three prong on it, either assembled that way or somebody else put it on there. Of course, moving back, everybody is familiar with the front sight tower on the AR-15 or the M16 with the uh, front sight post that is elevated. You can use the bullet tip to depress a little detent and then make gross elevation changes right up here on the front. Now, the barrel on the AR-70 is a little bit unique. You do see sort of a uh, birdcage flash hider. Now, this is actually a barrel shroud, and when I disassemble this, you'll be able to see that. Front sight tower and gas block. Again, this is piston driven. This is not held in by any type of taper pins or anything like that, which you have on the AR-15, so a lot easier to disassemble. The front sight is just protected by two ears, just like on the M16, and the front sight post is actually very similar you can definitely see the direct influence from the M16, and it does rotate for gross uh, elevation adjustments. Now moving back, of course, everybody is familiar with the iconic triangular handguards that were found on the Colt SP-1 and the early M16A1s and all that sort of thing. Sling swivel was down here, and of course there is a bayonet lug. Now this is a two-piece set, a left and a right hand. Later on the M16, they would change to a top and bottom, of course, because that is reversible. You can put the top on the top or the top on the bottom, the bottom on the top, it doesn't matter. When you have these old versions, you had a left and a right panel, so they were specific to what side they went on. Typically, you know, if you are missing the right panel, you need a right panel. You can't just get a standard, you know, forward hand grip. So that was one thing that they would change, but of course these are very iconic. Now the AR-70 handguard is polymer as well. It is molded from a left and a right hand half as well, but riveted inside, which keep the two parts together as one unit. So you don't remove one half and then the other, the whole piece comes right off. And it's just held in place by pressure, really, at the front of this little, little cap and then resting in a notch here in the receiver, which again, I'll show you at disassembly. Moving into the receiver, of course, again, a lot of people are, are familiar with this. Now, one quick way you can tell from any type of pictures or anything that you are looking at an SP-1 rather than an actual M16 or M16A1 is the little uh, pivot pin up here is actually a captive little screw and keeper, if you will, and the, the screws right in so you see a flat head screw right here. Of course, on an original M16, it would just be a little detent pen, just like we're used to. The whole diameter is also larger. So if you're gonna build a retro M16 off of an M16 parts kit and you get a lower receiver, a SP1 receiver will not work unless you get an adapter because the pivot pen hole size is different. So one little factoid there. Of course, this is a full slab side. There is no um, boss around the mag release or any type of detent pen boss up here. Uh, this would have been like a similar configuration of an early 601 or 602 uh, on this SP-1. But of course, the other features that are common is a fixed carry handle. You do have your sight up here, which is adjustable for uh, windage here on the back. And of course, you have two aperture sight settings as well. Magazine releases, of course, right here. There is a dust cover, as you're all aware and you have your toggle here for safe semi and an original one would be full auto and then you have a bolt release here beretta ar70 magazine is stamped metal of course you do have a stamped rear sight housing here as well and it's a little bit more robust a little bit heavier than on the ar15 you don't have any type of fixed carry handle you do have little brackets here if you want to mount any type of scope or anything there is a nice dust cover right here, which does automatically open when you bring the bolt to the rear. Now the carry handle does reciprocate and it, and it is on the right hand side of the firearm, just like on an AK. 
Your controls are here between toggling between safe semi and of course full auto on an original. Now you will see the bolt release is very reminiscent of that found on the M16. Magazine release is down here on the bottom again like an AK. Push it and then rock out again like an AK to put the mag in you rock it back in. But a very nice oversized mag release if you're using gloves or anything like that. Very nice and easy to get to. Another interesting thing is the pistol grip kind of has the contours of like a modern Magpul grip. So they were really configuring for comfort on these things. And again, sort of looks like they grip on a SIG 550 or anything like that. Now you have two aperture sights, just like on an AR-15 that you can toggle between. You can also make L or windage adjustments here on the back, but you do toggle between 150 and 300 meters. And it's just a little peep aperture sight, again, just like on the AR. Now, finishing up on the back end, now, of course, the SP-1 does have a tra traditional M16A1 type of stock. The early M16 stocks would not have a trap door. Also, the sling swivel would be able to rotate. It was more like a little stud, and then it was on a pivot. This is fixed. Uh, sort of a polymer construction, as I tell in the earlier ones. A shorter length of pull on the A2, they would go to a longer length of pull, of course, but not adjustable, fixed A1 or A2 style stock. The buttstock on the AR-70 is very similar. You do have a little sling stud right here on this side, the corresponding stud right up here fixed at the front. So you are hanging on the side of the firearm as opposed to the bottom. Again, it does have a shorter length of pull. You do not have any type of uh, trap door or anything in the back, but uh, again, sort of a polymer Zytel type construction. Gets the job done, no adjustment. Now let's go ahead and take a look at a weight of these rifles. They are unloaded. The SP-1 comes in at 6 pounds, 15 ounces. And the AR-70. Eight pounds, eight ounces. So we are looking at you know, about pretty much just shy of two full pounds. You do definitely feel that weight. It is a little bit more robust. So that is definitely one positive on the AR-15 or the M16 pattern that everybody's always talked about is that just really low weight for what you get. Now let's go ahead and talk about the disassembly of each. Of course, you guys have all done this a million times or seen it done a million times. An AR-15, you just push the rear pivot pin or, t or detent pin or takedown pin, I guess. Take the uh, bolt out the back can then bring out the carry handle and that is really it. Uh, if you want to you can also take out the pivot pin at the front and separate the two halves. You can take down the bolt a little bit more but by and large most people recognize this as a standard field strip on the M16 or AR-15. Okay let's look at the field strip of the AR-70 and you're of course going to notice quite a bit of uh, more complication here so let's go ahead and take that magazine out. Check that we are clear. By the way this bolt it is incredibly smooth. There are fewer firearms I have felt with such a really light bolt throw, so I do really like that. Anyway, you are going to need the tip of a bullet or a screwdriver to help. There is a little detent right here, sort of in the, in the uh, bolt carrier. You can push that in. It is spring-loaded. You push that back, and then that allows you to bring out your charging handle. Now, this linked the bolt carrier to the main spring or the recoil spring which is actually up here not back in the firearm itself so a little bit of an interesting design so that is now loose and disengaged there now there is a little cross pin here in the back just like you found on the ar which is really really tight i'll see if i can do this without a punch but i'll use the tip of this bullet here this is a uh, snap snap cap by the way so Anyway, I was able to get that out. Some of these are tighter than others. I've handled a couple of these. It is not captive, so it will come right out. And of course, you can hinge it open just like you could on an AR. Go ahead and bring the bolt carrier right out the back, and there it is. Now, bringing this in, you will notice it rotates very, very similarly to an AK-47 bolt. So you can definitely see the obvious similarities there with a couple locking lugs here. This is actually, I'm sorry, that's the cam surface. Two locking lugs right up here, locking the recesses in the front of, uh, right up there in the chamber. And of course, back there, you can see that is the rear of your firing pin. So, you can obviously see the influences there. 
that is struck by a hammer down here in the lower receiver, very similar to an AR-15. Also very similar to an AK. Now the front pivot pin is held in place by a set of little C clamps on both sides. You can remove those and drive that pin out if you want to. It is going to be more complicated than it would be on an M16. And on a lot of these, if you're ever looking at an AR-70, sometimes these are missing. So just keep an eye on that. Without those in there, this thing can back out on you while you're shooting. So just something to be mindful of. So that, I mean, that could be it for disassembly. I will go ahead and disassemble the front end just to show you sort of a couple more unique features about this. There is a, again, little spring-loaded clamp here on the front, which you can just pop down. You'll need to get it off the barrel and off the gas tube. I think this has to be rotated down, if I'm not mistaken. Get that off of the gas tube as well. This hinges right off of there. So there is a little hinge point on the back of the furniture which goes around that pivot pin. So it has to be sort of aligned in the right position here to be able to come right off. So anyway, that's all that holds that in place. With that out of the way, there is a little uh, latch here on the front of the sight base. Make sure I'm pushing that, push it towards the bottom. That hole is sort of in a ratcheting effect, if you will, the little uh, sleeve, barrel sleeve in place. So push that in and then it can thread right off. And that exposes the actual end of the barrel. This is again, just a little, a little sleeve here with a uh, flash rider on it. Now with that off, the uh, gas block is actually loose. There's nothing holding it in place, no taper pins or anything. It's just held on place by the sleeve. With that off, the little piston uh, and mainspring sleeve can slide right off. And then this is your mainspring and your piston. So this is your recoil spring right here. Interesting that it's up in the handguard. Now you do have to sort of drive it back, rotate it. Sorry, bear with me here. And then you can pull that out. Now, if you wanna take your mainspring off, you can drive out this little pin, take your mainspring off and clean it. There's your piston. So very, very interesting design concept. If you wanted to get into a complete and total field strip, that's it. So it's actually pretty complicated. There's a lot of parts to this. But, you know, there you go. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. And if you wanna see more content like this, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification button so that you will be notified when I post new content. If you have any questions, please leave those down in the comment section and I will try and get to them if I can. Anyway, guys, I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.